the factory. A place of industry. A place to work. But in small town America in the 20th century, the factory was also a place of community. A place where generations of families and friends worked side by side, building the things that would shape a nation's economy and its culture. The factory on South M66 in Ionia, Michigan began manufacturing in 1912 and served as a source of employment and small town pride for 92 years. And while the names of the buildings and the names of the owners may have changed over the years, the folks who worked there became like family, forming lasting friendships. We raised our kids together. Uh, anytime there was a celebration of a birthday or a holiday, we brought food in, cakes in, and we watched our children grow up. I knew that my mom and dad had met there. I knew that hundreds or thousands of people's moms and dads had met there. Everybody was a family and they, they all worked together. And somebody needed help, everybody was there to help them. You got to know a lot of people and we're still friends with them. We, we still do things together. We, you know, it's a last, lasting relationships with the people that we worked with. This is their story. The story of a dedicated workforce that answered their country's call in time of war and elevated their nation's standard of living in peacetime by manufacturing quality products at the factory in Ionia, Michigan, USA. Like so many tales from the pages of history, the story of the factory begins with a visionary. In this case, a civic-minded and ambitious young man fresh out of law school. Fred Green was an attorney and a Spanish-American War veteran. He teamed up with some friends and formed the Ypsilanti Reed Furniture Company that they moved to Ionia and they built one building and then they built two more buildings. And by 1917, they were the number one seller of reed and bamboo furniture in the world. He sent his people to Singapore and lined up a supply uh, business there that could keep the flow coming so they could keep building. They brought in 200 tons of product every month. That's how much furniture they were building. My grandfather was hired in. Uh, Fred Green went and got him from Charlotte and brought him up here when they were making reed furniture, and he managed the plant for him. My grandfather thought Fred Green was a real nice man, a real good man. They were real good friends. The Ypsilanti Reed Furniture Company sold reed and wicker furniture and accessories to a global market. And while they had showrooms in New York City and Chicago, their workforce stayed local, thanks to their visionary owner. Fred Green was this town. He was our mayor for 12 years. He was also active in the fishing and hunting club. I think of Fred Green as our answer to Teddy Roosevelt. He was an outdoor man. He appreciated green spaces, and he set aside areas at our county park. Like many business leaders of his time, Fred Green was also civic-minded and involved in his community. After his time serving as the mayor of Ionia, he ran for governor of Michigan, using green canes produced at Ipsy Reed as the symbol of his campaign. Green was elected governor in 1926. After serving two terms, he chose to return to Ionia to help the factory climb out of the Great Depression. It looked like things were gonna turn around and that the plant was gonna prosper again, but he went on a hunting trip in 1936 and suffered a heart attack and died in the woods. Governor Green's death in 1936 could have meant the end of the factory and a devastating blow to the town of Ionia. But another gifted businessman came along and saved the day. Answering the call from Mr. Green's widow, Helen, who had taken the helm upon her husband's death, Don Mitchell came to Ionia and agreed to become a consultant for the plant. He developed a plan to put the people of Ionia to work, 
and to help Mrs. Green avoid financial ruin. And while he joined Ipsy Reed as a consultant, Don Mitchell quickly became the mastermind behind the entire operation, bringing in automotive production to the factory. He was a visionary, he was an idea man, he'd been through the depression and he had a real appreciation for what hard work could do. Making money to make money just was not part of his thinking. He was always about putting people to work, creating jobs. He diversified the plant in Ionia, that's the first thing he did, was sure we can still keep making this great furniture, but times are changing and we have to change. His expertise was in automotive and in plastics. He was pretty much in on the, on the beginning of, of those two industries. Once Don Mitchell came to Ionia and agreed to take over the Ypsilanti Reed and help Mrs. Green to turn it around, he never looked back. He was part of the family. He was there and he was for the people. He did things that a lot of them appreciated is what he was doing for them. Every Thanksgiving, every worker got a turkey. Every Christmas, they got a ham. He knew virtually all the people in the plant, and he was just so responsible to those that he had working for him. And the conclusion that everyone pretty much around him was, Don Mitchell put Ionia, Michigan on the map. As a result of Don Mitchell's efforts, as well as those of his employees, the factory was well positioned to assist the Department of Defense when the U.S. entered World War II following the attack on Pearl Harbor. This was a time of blackouts to hide the factory from potential aerial bombardment from the Germans or the Japanese. The plant went into high gear, producing military jeeps and buses, and tarps for tents and to cover anti-aircraft guns. The name of the factory changed to the Ionia Manufacturing Company, reflecting a more diverse range of business operations. During World War II, the plant in Ionia was well situated to supply both coasts of the United States with military items that they needed. They did jeep seats. One of the most extensive projects that they did they got an SOS from the Department of Defense that they needed 46,000 tarps. They would be like large canvas that could be made into a tent. And they needed them soon because Russian people were going to be freezing in the winter if they didn't get them. And the folks at the Ipsy Reed went to work, they supplied what they needed, and those 46,000 tarps were sent off and, and people were saved. The determination and hard work of Ionia's workforce helped the Americans turn the tide of war. The Department of Defense recognized these efforts and came to town in 1944. The United States military had an award called the E Award and it was given to plants for outstanding service. You had specific quantities that you had met, you had high quality in what you turned out, you had no work stoppages you had a clean environment at your plant, and so this award was presented. Officials came from the military. Don Mitchell was on the podium, along with Mrs. Green, in a very pretty suit and hat. The Ionia High School marching band came down from the high school, and they played for the event in their blue and white suits. And it was very a festive atmosphere. There was bunting hanging around the plant and all around the stage. Everything was red, white, and blue. And I love the sign that was outside the plant that said, in war or peace, Ipsy Reed. Before the war was over, Don Mitchell was already anticipating what the soldiers and their families would need when they came home. And so, he prepared the Ionia plant to be a leader in peacetime just as they had been during the war. In the midst of post-war economic expansion and the baby boom, Don Mitchell and the Ionia engineering team prepared for the full-scale manufacturing of wood-paneled station wagons built for the entire family, a family on the move. 
The plant in Ionia was a major producer of the woody, which was a station wagon body with wood parts on the side. They were a perfect car for a returning veteran, and that was Don Mitchell's whole idea, was to give them something comfortable and cool and stylish that they could use to raise their family, which is what they would be doing when they came home from the war. This car was a hit on both coasts, and thousands and thousands of them were sold. Well, the Moody family car, I guess, was something that was really needed at the plant at that time. Put a lot of people to work, and they did a real good job on it, was commended for it. They were a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful car. We put all the interior in them, and everything. They didn't have the chass chassis or motor around it, but like that, just the bodies. And we put in the seats, the carpet in, the, the instrument panel, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it was a beautiful car. In the 1950s, Don Mitchell merged the Ionia plant with the Owasso Manufacturing Company, owned by Calvin P. Bentley. The combined operation would expand capacity and bring in more business. The name of the factory changed again to the locally owned Mitchell Bentley Corporation. The Mitchell Bentley Corporation was always ready to try any new project. They had 85 engineers and if you brought them an idea, they were going to work with it and they were going to find a way to make it work for you. We worked on a lot of cars that were uh, made specifically for uh, well-known people. Ed Sullivan and his wife each ordered a station wagon. It had a special interior, special paint job, and all the works. With the success of the Woody, Mitchell Bentley became the largest independent manufacturer of station wagons. The die was cast. The factory in Ionia was now mainly an automotive plant. And Don Mitchell would soon retire and transfer the company to new ownership having kept his promise to Mrs. Green to bring the factory back to prominence. In the 1960s, the A.O. Smith Corporation invested in the Ionia plant, moving production towards fiberglass and injection molded plastics. As a result, the era of the muscle car came to Ionia with the Corvette Stingray and the Shelby Cobra, among others. The fiberglass molding plant that came into Ionia really changed the picture. It was bringing in new kinds of workers, it was bringing in a new way of manufacturing, and it certainly added a lot of jobs to the Ionia community. It was a boon to the community of Ionia. Auto production was, actually it was the lifeblood of Ionia at that time. I worked there for several years myself, and had a lot of friends who worked there. and. Uh, it, it, they made some absolutely beautiful cars, some one of a kind. I can remember that we tore the motors out of them and rebuilt them, and fixed them all up and shipped them, took them out back and tested them. And by testing them, it was just people that drove them to park them was kind of driving them to see what they would do. The Shelby Cobra and the Stingray that were manufactured at the Ionia plant are a magnet to car lovers. It's not unusual to have people come into town to try to find the plant where their car was made. They are that much in love with those automobiles. As the classic era of the 60s muscle car faded into the 1970s, molded plastic products increasingly became part of every phase of American life. Plant ownership changed again, and the operations of the factory diversified once more. Under the ownership of GenCorp, a division of General Tire, the Ionia factory still made parts for cars and trucks, but they also made other items of compression molded fiberglass, including trays for schools and hospitals, as well as other items that served the public. There were several things at GenCorp, mainly plastic or fiberglass. They called it General Tire, but we didn't do tires. We did little plastic parts for cars pictures and uh, glassware, that was all plastic. 
plastic trays, and they call that the Bolta line. I worked in several departments. The fifth floor on the Blazer line was my first job. We kind of came in when they were doing the Blazers and the Jeeps for GM and uh, for Ford with it head front ends and hoods for them. The big Mack trucks, we did uh, hoods for those, the truck semis. We uh, made hopper covers and worked in the fiberglass. It was nice to see things build, the new things that came in, you know, and it made it must feel good because we had a finished product. The best thing about working for GenCorp, I guess, was the fact that they had taken over the plant and kept a lot of people working when things were getting real slow. I think that was me about the, the best. I enjoyed myself working there all the time. GenCorp employees, like the employees of A.O. Smith, Mitchell Bentley, and Ipsy Reed before them, formed long-lasting relationships with co-workers as they worked side by side every day. You could hear people working down the line, sanders going, screw guns working. Um, we could talk and visit with our neighbors, have coffee at our areas, so that was a pleasure. And a lot of us ate at our own workstations. We had chairs and stools we sat at and could visit and play cards on tables if we wanted to. It's the people. You enjoy being with the people. You, you, you grew up with, our kids grew up with each other. You know, you, you, you were just like family. So, you know, that's the way, that was the way it was. For almost 100 years, thousands of men and women raised their families and enriched the community because they had a job at the factory. But the winds of change were about to blow. The struggles faced by American manufacturing from coast to coast, the downsizing of plants and the offshoring of work would soon come to Ionia. Towards the end of the 20th century, the plant was showing its age. Modern manufacturing now required speed and flexibility to respond to the demands of a rapidly changing global marketplace. The factory was falling behind. A lot of times products would change the material and we had a hard time keeping up with the materials that they needed for those products and a lot of them fell through. Back in the 90s we heard all kinds of rumors about what was going to happen here and there and everybody was always wondering what was going to happen next. So we just, they were kind of all up in the air most of the time. We knew at that point that things had broken down enough with uh, GenCor that it probably was not going to be able to survive as an automotive manufacturing plant. So what we were trying to do was get the plant in a saleable condition so that the city could actually take over the site um, and turn it into something that would be commercially uh, uh, usable. New ownership took over and decided to shut down the factory in 1995. And so it was that the factory on South M66 in Ionia, Michigan was condemned to meet the wrecking ball. The investments made by Fred Green and Don Mitchell decades before would be reduced to rubble. I was there and a friend of mine who was working on the uh, local newspaper was there and the two of us were uh, taking videos of the destruction of the offices, that was pretty rough. We started watching that from day one. Um, uh, my friends and I, we'd go out and sit at the, on the other side of the street and watch the building get tore down and, and reminisce about how we sat in that window up on the fifth floor that connected A building to B building and watched that get demolished and it was heartbreaking. Oh golly, I really felt bad. It was, it was a place that I'd been pretty near all my life. And a place a lot of people had, had worked, enjoyed themselves, and it, it just made for, made for a lot of hurt feelings. Well, we didn't like it very much. It was history going down the drain, you know, they just, they just tore it all apart. And there was a lot of people that used to work there you know, and, and good memories, and, and it was gone.
History will record that the vision and community spirit of business leaders, supported by the dedication of a loyal workforce, put this small town on the map as an innovative center of manufacturing that was known around the world. In times of war and peace, reed furniture, jeep seats and tents, the Woody station wagon, the Shelby Cobra and Corvette Stingray sports cars are just a few examples of the excellence in engineering and quality production that continued in this Ionia institution for almost 100 years. The disappearance of factories from small town of America is symptomatic of a total change in the way things are sold and manufactured. And it is an era where we have the technology that certainly has taken us forward, but you know that jobs have been lost and that community pride has been changed. And when I look back of the history of the building that was here, what it meant to the people locally, what it meant to our soldiers sent around the world, where you come from makes a difference. Made in Ionia, it made a difference and it made that difference all across this country. There are going to be changes and there's going to be improvements, but I hope we never forget that we started local. We started in our hometowns and that that still matters and that as we move ahead, the proper respect is paid to all those who laid the groundwork and all those who worked hard to make this country what it is today.